Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, virtual salon hosted by 1880, which for those of you who are members, you'll know very well is the Singapore's best uh, club. And for those of you who are not 1880 members or even who are joining us outside of Singapore, uh, get your friends to take you there next time you're able to visit. So my name is James Crabtree. Uh, officially, I'm the executive director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, but uh, I used to work for the Financial Times, and therefore I used to be a, a very junior colleague of Gillian Tett, our guest speaker for this evening. And we are here gathered to talk about Gillian's excellent new book, AnthroVision. Um, and Gillian has joined us this evening at a very, un, a very early hour of 7.30 uh, a.m. in New York. Um, so hello, Gillian. Uh, you, can, you can wave here. Hi. Um, there we go. And, and so Gillian's book has recently been released to wide acclaim, good reviews in all of the right places. Um, I was, have read it over the last few days and it's, uh, it's really fascinating uh, canter through not only her own, she says it's not a memoir, but uh, her own personal uh, history as a, a young anthropologist doing a PhD in Tajikistan, and then how those skills uh, formed her career as a journalist, allowed her to see the 2008 financial crisis and a whole bunch of other things besides. Also joining us this evening, again, a familiar face to, to particular those of you who live in Singapore, Piyush Gupta, who's the chief executive of DBS. Uh, well, well I'm the best bank in the world, according to the current rankings, um, uh, certainly the most, the best known rank in, bank in Singapore, um, and an unusually thoughtful observer of the business scene uh, here in Southeast Asia, and also a, a, a leader in the world of technology and finance. And so what we're going to do is, um, Gillian is going to talk about the book for about 10 minutes, um, and uh, give you a kind of sense of the main thesis of AnthroVision, and how anthropology can explain business and life. Then I'm going to turn to Piyush. Uh, he's also read the book, so he's going to give some reflections on, uh, on what he took out of it. Then we'll have a conversation. Um, and then uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Q&A. Um, so you can use the chat function uh, or the Q&A function is probably the best one to use. So one of those two anyway is going to work. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute which one's actually working. And you can ask, uh, ask questions of the panelists. That can be about the book or it can be about anything you like. If there's something that you wanted Julian to ask about, then it's um, all, all questions on, all Piyush and D. Um, and we'll wrap up in one hour. So it's going to be a, a crisp session for those of you uh, who it's evening here in Singapore, lunchtime in the UK, or breakfast time, as Julian knows, in New York. Um, so with that, Julian, um, uh, I, I guess I should introduce you. So multiply published author, um, uh, FT columnist, now uh, um, running, running a, a stream of work in the FT, looking at sustainable business and sustainable finance, but a commentator on all manner of things for those of you who read her columns during the week and on the weekend. Um, and uh, anyway, that's it. Over to you, Julian. Do you want to tell us about AnthroVision and what we can all learn from it? Well, thank you very much indeed, James. And it's great to have a chance to chat to you all. I should say my day job, as I always say this for my, in case the FT kills me, um, I actually chair the editorial board of the FT in America, which means Brains Trust. That's what my day job is. Um, I should start by saying that, first of all, I'm delighted to have a chance to talk to an audience in Singapore because I quite literally owe my life to Singapore twice over. Um, a few years ago, I was in Singapore and was ill with meningitis and septicemia and almost died were it not for the fact that an amazing medical team in Singapore saved me and left me awestruck by the medical um, facilities in, in Singapore. And in the course of that, another peculiar thing happened because my father was born in Singapore um, and had never gone back until I fell ill and he had to go back to Singapore. Um, one of his earliest memories was running through the streets um, during World War II and then being flung from the port down to a, a boat um, during the war to escape. And that memory actually played in indirectly as to why I wrote this book because I grew up in a very suburban, boring part of London, but with folk memories of my family of running across borders, cultural conflict, culture clash. And that has made me fascinated all my life by the question of culture. Culture. It's one of the most frustrating things to try and define or to analyze. It's a bit like trying to chase soap in the bath. Um, but we all know that culture influences us 
deeply. We also know that we have different cultures. Cultures don't exist as boxes. You can't rank them um, in a hierarchy. They don't have fixed, clear-cut, static borders. They're constantly changing. And yet the reality is that humankind has a spectrum of cultural difference. And these cultural differences influence us deeply, um, particularly if we ignore them. So in a sense, that helped prompt me to go into anthropology, a discipline which is devoted to studying human culture. I should stress that I've been trained in cultural anthropology, which looks at the modern day, not physical anthropology, which looks at human evolution. And I spent much of my career as a journalist um, working in the field of finance and business and politics, trying to explain to grown up people who ran companies, ran countries, ran finance ministries or anything else, why this weird background actually is relevant. Um, my own work as an academic, as an anthropologist, before I became a journalist, was based on doing field work and research in a place called Soviet Tajikistan. It was still the Soviet Union in those days. Um, and I studied Tajik wedding rituals. Um, I was using a study of the ceremonies and cultural practices and exchanges and all the rituals around it in Tajik wedding rituals to explore the clash and tension that did or did not exist between Islam and communism in Soviet Central Asia in the last few years of the Soviet Union, although we didn't know it was the last few years at the time. And that seems completely disconnected to questions about central bank monetary policy, the great financial crisis, the tech clash, Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a core argument in this book is actually they are connected because humans are humans everywhere they're found, whether in the Amazon jungle or an Amazon warehouse, or in the White House or anywhere else. And the reality is exactly the same tools that I used to study tragic wedding rituals um, all those years ago can be incredibly powerful in terms of making sense of what politicians and financiers and business people do. Um, the book basically gives a lot of examples of how and why I've used it in my own journalistic career. Um, it really was absolutely central to predicting the great financial crisis, which I did back in 2005, basically using a toolkit, which was similar to what I'd use in Tajik wedding rituals to analyze what was happening at investment banking conferences. Investment banking conferences basically are the modern financial equivalent of a Tajik wedding for bankers. And I say, it can be very revealing to look at the ceremonies and practices. But one of the key messages of this book is that the kind of tools I would use to make sense of finance, tech clash, that I used to say that there was a good chance that Donald Trump would win the 2016 election, and also to write about the rise of sustainability, which is one thing I've been doing in recent years. Those tools aren't just for journalists. They can be used in any field, whether you're a lawyer, a financier, a techie, um, a policymaker, economist, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason they can be used, and this is my last key point, rather than go through the book in too much detail, but the reason they can be used in almost any context and should be used in any context, just as people have learned to use tools from psychology in making sense of their lives, even if they're not academic psychologists. But the reason why anthropology can be powerful is that people think that anthropology is a bit like Indiana Jones for grown-ups or for academics. It's about people going off to study culture in weird and wacky parts of the world, um, digging up bones, looking at exotic rituals, peering at strange people. That's a stereotype of cultural anthropology. It's not surprising because that's actually how anthropology did start in the 19th century. It was initially a pretty racist, sexist, imperialist endeavor carried out by a group of mostly or almost entirely white European men peering at other cultures to try and essentially dismiss them, denigrate them or control them. But in the 20th century, anthropology did a complete U-turn and went from being a bastion of racism and imperialism to being one of the parts of social science that most strongly has fought against racism and imperialism and sexism 
and try to argue that human beings are all valid wherever they live. And actually we need to embrace and empathize and understand different cultures in a globalized world. That really is one of the core messages of anthropology today. And the way to understand what anthropologists do today is really best captured by a three part um, schema or framework that I lay out in the book. Um, and it's really sort of three elements of anthropology. Firstly, anthropologists passionately believe that there's enormous value for everybody in trying to make the strange familiar. And by that, I mean, by trying to spend a moment or two or longer if you can in your lives, trying to empathize and understand cultures that seem different from you. We need to learn to not run away from culture shock, but embrace it in our lives. Because the task of trying to empathize with people who seem different from you, trying to walk in their shoes, trying to actually see the world through their eyes, which in many ways sounds so obvious, but is so often forgotten. That task of gaining empathy for cultural difference is absolutely invaluable and crucial in a world that's both globalized and polarized. And that applies as much to policymakers, business leaders, financiers, and everyone else. Anybody who's trying to craft a strategy in a globalized world needs to recognize a very simple point that Genevieve Bell used to always tell her bosses at Intel when she was working for them, and she's an anthropologist who worked for Intel. The key point is just because it's your worldview or your way of thinking, it doesn't mean it's everyone's else. Terribly obvious, too often forgotten. But the second point about anthropology is that anthropology gives you a win-win. It's not just about understanding other people and getting empathy for others. The fact of trying to do that gives you more self-knowledge about yourself too. There's a great Chinese proverb that a fish can't see water. Unless a fish jumps out of its fishbowl, goes and swims in other fishbowls, or goes and asks other fish what they think about their fishbowl. And then you have a better chance of seeing water more clearly. If you want to understand the flaws, the dangers, the hidden risks, what's hidden in plain sight in your own world, jumping out of your fishbowl is crucial. And that's what anthropologists do. They spend as much time today studying the Western world as they do the non-Western world, precisely because of this insider-outsider perspective being so valuable. And the last point, and I will stop off this, is that when you take that insider-outsider perspective, when you start to become a stranger in your own land, when you have empathy for other cultures, the real benefit is you can start to see what's hidden in plain sight. Because to go back to that fishbowl analogy, we spend a lot of time in our lives understandably focusing on the noisy parts of our lives, all the things that are obvious above the surface, because we live in a world where we're drowning in noise. Silence matters. The stuff we don't talk about in our lives, the cultural assumptions that we inherit from our surroundings and just ignore because they seem so taboo and, or obvious or boring or geeky and dull is absolutely critical. And at the end of the day, I think that's what anthropology can really give us. It's what we need right now as we try and think about the world post pandemic. And it's one of the things that I'm actually most happy and excited to talk about in terms of how and why my own weird, weird background um, from Tajik wedding rituals all the way to writing about Tokyo or about derivatives or anything else actually is connected. So thanks for listening. I'll stop there. I say the book lays out in enormous detail how and why this has worked, not just in relation to finance, which I've written about for years, but also the tech sector, the medical world, um, the world of sustainability and policy making. But very happy to hand over to you, Piyush. It's a great honor to have you talking about the book along with James and um, very happy to take questions on this or anything else at all. So thank you. All right, um, I want to uh, get in. So first of all, uh, Jillian, let me say, um, the first few pages of your book, I thought it was sort of a pain to anthropology in defense of anthropologists. And I got to tell you that um, as I read the book, this is probably one of the most important and most useful books I've read in several years. Um, it's, it's a good read, but more importantly, it's a really thoughtful book. So 
you know, I see we have over 100 participants now. I recommend it to all of you. I think it's a, it's a great read. Um, must read. One of my, I don't say this lightly. I read a lot, but the very few books I go out and uh, push and say it's a must read, I think it's a must read book. Um, I think the, the things that I took away, one which you know and you refer to, Jillian, uh, culture and context matters. I remember, you know, I was work, I used to work with City, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s. I represented City Asia, and I was in this constant battles with New York because they wanted to roll out standard products and standard processes around the world. And I'd be in these late night battles telling them, look, this is not going to work in, you know, India, or Indonesia, Philippines, it doesn't work like that. And I still remember this big argument on, you know, McDonald's rolls out the same cookie cutter burger everywhere, so why can't we do it? And I should tell them, you know what, McDonald's is going to have to change because uh, what people are looking for in the food experience in countries like Southeast Asia, or frankly, even people don't eat beef in some countries. I mean, you've got to cater for all of these things. So I think culture and context matters. In our own uh, banking business, I'll give you two uh, examples, which are really quite interesting. So one is I've always believed, I've, you know, same cultural bias, that we all know that if you want to advertise a financial product, the best way to get the consumer's attention is to put the rate of interest big bold in the middle of advertisement. So if it's a low rate loan, you put low rate 3%. If it's a high rate deposit, you put high rate 7%. And so I wanted to roll out the product in Indonesia, a digital product. And my team that came back and said, Piyush, in Indonesia, the rate is not important. I, what's more important is you need to focus on the gift that you're giving. And so if you can show the umbrella that you're giving, that's a lot more powerful than the number. And I resisted it till they demonstrated to me they were right. You know, there's some billionaires who put opened an account, put millions of dollars with us only because we were willing to give them a cheap 30 bucks safe, deposit safe. That's all they were bothered about. So a culture is matter even in banking. I'll tell you another example. You know, we were launching our websites on all of our digital properties. And I was struck by all the research which said that people are bothered by how many clicks they need to make to get to where they want. They want clean, clean website frontages. They want a Google kind of experience. And repeatedly, my Chinese colleagues from China, Taiwan, etc., kept telling me that we need a cluttered site. We need a site which shows tons of things on the front page. And guess what? Eventually, they were right. That the Chinese psyche is that if you're not seeing tons of tons of pictures and things and data and things on the front page, the website looks uninteresting. They just want a site that shows a ton of stuff. So even in our experience, and even today, it's quite clear that you cannot assume one size fits all. The cultures and context uh, matters. That's particularly true, and maybe we'll talk about it later, Jillian, in the context of data. I'm convinced that people's perception and view of what data is, data privacy, what's relevant, what's important, uh, is important. And in fact, it's my second big takeaway from your book. What people um, say is different from what people do. And what people do is even different from what people think they do. And your last section on silence and why silence is so, understanding silence is so important is because just what people say is not exactly what they do. I said, you've got to observe what is it that they're actually doing. And then you've got to think of, they'll tell you this is what I think, but actually what they do is even different from what they think. And so I thought that whole section of trying to go through the silences to understand what's really important here and why are people doing what they're doing is really quite important. So at DBS, uh, just my last couple of minutes, you know, we stumbled on this whole idea of using deep observation about seven, eight years ago. We started our digital transformation in 2014. And we'd gone through a couple of years of a process we called process improvement. We sort of borrowed it from GE, the lean process. Uh, and we spent a lot of time at that session, number one, we spent a lot of time trying to clean up and simplify the process for handling a lost credit card. You know, when people, so how do you change? We change it from a three-week process to a five-day process. And I thought that the customer feedback would be off the charts. You know, we, now you can replace a lost credit card in five days. But we weren't getting that kind of feedback. Now, around the same time, Design Singapore had contracted with this U.S. design firm called Luma. Uh, the Luma design firm, which, whose focus is really ethnography. So uh, Luma stands for look, understand, and make. And they started teaching us these techniques for actually looking and understanding uh, what it is that people are doing. Uh, we also you know, uh, hired a person from j, j Johnson & Johnson, who was deeply into customer obsession and understanding the customer experience. So we took both of those, and then we went and hired our own uh, anthro uh, 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 we, didn't, we didn't hire anthropologists, though we had a couple. But we hired a team of ethnographers to come help us. And they taught us how to do observation. 
Uh, we actually set up a lab. We set up a lab for doing observational tools. We did low fidelity prototyping. We had cardboard ATMs. We actually invested in tools for doing eyeball tracking to see, you know, when we wanted to do a digital properties, what people actually do with the property and so on. And we developed our own methodology for customer journey management called 4D. The first D stands for discover. And discover was really about going out and discovery and doing observation and discovery and so on. So we really figured that this relentless focus on what is the true job to be done, which is understanding what is the true emotional need and psychological and social need of the customer is really important. And so this is a little bit first cousin of anthropology, if you will, but it's really this idea of you need to go out and observe. And if you go out and observe, you open your mind and find things that you never figure out later. So we made this a core part of our customer journey process. We embrace customer journey thinking. We've done about 700 journeys to date. And the heart of all of this journey work is really if you go deeply to understand what is behind what the customer is saying, doing, or reacting, you will get completely different outcomes. Now, you're going back to the credit card piece. We went back and figured with this whole observation what the problem was. And the problem was quite simple. Uh, we figured the first problem customers had is that in many cases, they didn't have cash in their pocket. So they weren't worried about, you know, how do I get my card in five days? They worried about how do I get home? I've got no money in my pocket. Second problem they had, they really worried somebody is going to be taking away all their savings because the card is lost. So how do they protect the savings which are going? The third worry was they're going to have to call six different banks and phone numbers because all their direct debits have been linked to the bank account and they need to stop all that before all the money gets siphoned away. So all the problems in the customer's mind weren't even problems which had anything to do with what we were solving for, which is how do I change your card eventually? And so we had to go back and rethink our whole process for what we needed to, how do you empathize with the customer? How do you tell them, well, look, we understand you have a problem, we'll take care, we'll give you the following phone numbers, we'll help you make the following calls. You had to solve for a completely different problem once you started doing the observation differently. And so, Jillian, a long way to say, um, I am a big believer in this idea that you need to observe, you need to get the context right. And uh, I just wind up where I started. I think your book's a great book. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's really very kind of you. Well, let, let, let's sort of dive in on that for a minute. So actually, we've got a few questions, so, and I'll ask one because it's relevant. So Julian Kayla, who's a, an associate professor of marketing at NTU, one of the universities here, um, he, he says uh, that he teaches ethnography at the university. What he really wants to know is how many uh, ethnographers do you hire, Piyush? Because if uh, Julian's in favor of this, do you, do, you, you, do you have a team or do you contract them in? How does it work at DBS? I'm actually like one of uh, Jillian's, I think, Intel. I had a bigger team of ethnographers. When I checked with my guys uh, in preparation for this, how many do we have now? I think we have only a couple of ethnographers left on our roles. Uh, but at the same time, I have to this day, we've trained up a lot of people in this observation ritual. So we spend a lot of time, in fact, including my senior most team, 250 people. We spent two full days at an offsite just teaching people how to do observation and how to do the first D of the 4D process. So we embraced a lot of it inside the bank, um, but we don't have, and then we, we, we hire people for projects, but uh, at this stage, we only have a couple. So Julian, so you- a second, James, yeah. and some, oh. say, some people watching may wonder what I mean by anthropology or ethnography or observation and stuff. So one thing I forgot to explain is one of the key methodological tools of cultural anthropology is really this idea that you try and put yourself into the community of people you're studying and observe them with an open mind, almost childlike wonder or act like a Martian without preset questions or ideas about what's important. And you just try and observe everything in context. Um, and traditionally anthropologists did that by actually going into the communities they were studying and actually living amongst them. In my case, I went to Tajikistan and actually lived as a Tajik girl wearing Tajik clothes, eating Tajik food, sleeping on the floor with the family I lived in up in the high mountains to just try and observe them for a year. Um, today in the digital world, a lot of observation increasingly happens online and in networks, not just single communities. Um, and that was happening even before COVID, obviously. And when anthropologists work or do ethnography for companies or others, it tends to be much shorter in duration and almost ethnography light which you know, some academics say that's not proper ethnography, that's not proper anthropology. Other people say actually it's still very valuable. Um, but ethnography is a methodology you use to observe people. Anthropology on top of that has a whole bunch of theories about humans work. And that's really how the two things are different. So I just thought I should explain that for anyone watching. Yeah, 
So, so Jillian, let me let me ask you the related question. Sorry, James, I'm taking you this thing, but go ahead. go ahead. You know, we're finding that because so much of what people do is in the virtual world today, uh, tracking digital footprints gives you a really good idea of what's uh, uh, the customer, what's in the customer's mind, what they're doing. So we're instrumenting the heck out of everything. And our instrumentation tells us second to second, you know, what happened when the customer came to any of our properties, how long did they spend on a page, what did they go and click on first, which article did they read, how did they get from point A to point B, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm finding that actually tracking the digital footprint gives you tremendous insights on how customers actually behave, what's important to them and what's not. And by the way, you also understand what that is very different country by country. Customers in one country tend to flock to something. Customers in a different country or market tend to do something different. Now, do you think the instrumentation and tracking, would you call that ethnography? And is that consistent with your whole view on uh, deep observation? Well, I would call that another form of human observation. And in many ways, it can be fantastically useful. And I am not arguing for milliseconds that it is not useful and should not be used. Big data is absolutely amazing. Um, but there are three issues about big data that people who are using it should bear in mind, particularly if they're using it then to essentially be the fuel for artificial intelligence platforms. Firstly, big data operates by hoovering up vast amounts of information about what human beings are doing in the current or very recent past and extrapolating it forward. And, you know, that can be obviously extremely useful um, unless something is causing behavior to change. You know, because as you know from any financial product, the past is not always a good guide to the future. And the thing that can sometimes, you know, cause behavior to change can be the stuff that's outside the model you're collecting. You know, big data, like any modern intellectual tool, is essentially bounded and defined by the limits of what you decide to put into that model. Same applies for an economic model or a corporate balance sheet and a big data set. Um, so if something's causing the, the, you know, the patterns to change, if the context is shifting, then that matters. And sometimes the context does shift, like today in relation to say, the physical also world environment and climate change. Um, the second point is that, um, you know, big data can explain what's, what is happening. It, it looks at patterns and correlations, doesn't always explain causation. And you may or may not need to know exactly the causation, but, you know, one of the things is that big data tends to assume that individuals are all behaving individually like molecules or atoms. Um, and as Richard Feynman once said, you know, physics would be easy uh, sorry, physics would not be possible to do if the atoms could talk to each other. And there tends to be a focus in big data on individuals being isolated individuals, and the same is true of psychology. And in fact, that's not the case. You know, human relations, interactions matter enormously. Um, I explain in my book, I tell the story of Cambridge Analytica, and there's a wonderful point made by one of the people who um, created the forerunner of Cambridge Analytica, who split with Alexander Nix, um, which is that there was so much hullabaloo about Facebook and its likes and being a good guide to individual psychology in relation to politics. And what people missed was that if someone says, I like a hat online, it doesn't necessarily mean they like the physical hat. They like the physical, they, they, they like the relationship they have with a person who's posted about the hat. And that's a lot harder to track than um, many other aspects. And the third point really is that um, big data tracks noise. It tracks what people do and what they say. It's much harder to track silence. Um, and silence is matter. So for all those reasons, one of the really, really important messages of my book, I think, is that in a world of AI, artificial intelligence, we need another type of AI, anthropology intelligence. You know, or to put it another way, in a world of rising usage of big data, um, which is fantastic, we need to pay some attention to qualitative tools and context to make sense of what the quantitative tools are telling us. And my last bit point to illustrate why this matters is that there's one thing that no AI platform has done yet. Um, you know, they've played Go, they've beaten people at chess, they can scan financial markets, et cetera, et cetera. One thing no AI platform has ever done is to create a really good joke, a really good joke. Because jokes are interesting, A, because they define communities in a very subtle way. You have to be part of a social tribe. You have to be in the in-group to get the joke. 
But secondly, jokes play off all the contradictorily clashing layers of culture, which can't be defined by just a rational program. And they play off social silence. Um, so as long as we don't have AI platforms that can create good jokes that we humans find funny, I think we need to have two types of AI in our lives and put big data in context. No, very good. Well, actually, we had a question about this, Julian, from our, I presume this is the same Jeremy Grant, our former colleague, who I think you've answered his question. So he, he Jeremy wanted to know how should uh, AI and ethnography be used next to one another. But so before we dive sorry, into- Sorry, question, James, if I just want to push that point one last uh, bit. So Julian, it's not about AI and large models, it's about observation. So today we think about what Netflix does. So our observation and experimentation is what we're doing at DBS now. So I observe how you respond to digital properties, and then I keep experimenting by giving you alternatives. And I give you A-B control testing, I give you tens and dozens of alternatives, and I see how your response changes. What do you react better to and what do you react worse to? And by seeing how your response and reactions are changing all the time, I get a much better insight for how you think and what you're trying. Now, I don't know why you think that way, but I do know that if I make the font red and I put it on top of the screen, you're more likely to click on it. And if I you know, use a particular language, you're more likely to do something. So I can start observing what makes you tick as a person without necessarily knowing why that makes you tick. What do you think about that? No, I think that's a fair point. And you don't need, always need to understand what's deep inside someone's mind. Um, but another way to look at it is a really anthropology is also about checks and balances um, for the digital tools we have. It's about a way of, um, if, you, if you like, it's risk management. It's making sure that we don't just blindly rely on the robots and machines um, because sometimes they can go wrong because you, and it's usually because of cultural context. But it's not just about risk management in a negative way, although it often can be. I do, I do really think that anthropology is about checks and balances, risk management at its best. And that's one of the best reasons why people in business, finance, policy making should use it. But it can also be used in a positive way. Um, and very briefly, you know, anthropology shows why there was a gigantic missed opportunity for the West with COVID for two reasons. Firstly, or three reasons. Firstly, if there had been more of a culture of empathy for strangeness, um, the Western leaders would not have just ignored what was happening in Wuhan as something which was weird and exotic and banged on and on about exotic wet markets. Gosh, aren't they weird? Which by the way, was incredibly similar to how people reacted to Ebola initially as well. You know, everyone went on and on about bush feet in Ebola in West Africa. Um, there's a tremendous tendency in a pandemic to demonize and exoticize where the source of a pandemic is coming from. Um, and I describe that in chapter three of my book about the whole issue about pandemics and West Africa. So point one, empathy for others helps in actually positively trying to manage risk for pandemics but it also can provide inspiration for how to respond and craft policy in a positive way. Um, it's very clear from the history of Ebola in West Africa that doctors spent, wasted the first few months of the pandemic of Ebola by trying to beat it just with medical science, which never works. You need behavioral science and medical science. And once they embrace behavioral science, the path changed dramatically, but tragically it took several months. That lesson was forgotten with COVID initially. Behavioral science was downplayed in places like the UK in favor of an emphasis on medical science. You need both. But you can also learn lessons elsewhere. And so to cite an example from Asia, which people in Singapore will be familiar with, mask wearing helps to beat pandemics. Anthropologists have found in relation to SARS and everything else, not just because of the physical barrier of wearing a mask, but because putting a mask on has a psychological value in terms of prompting you to change your behavior and think about it. And it has a cultural value in terms of signaling to yourself and others that you're adhering to community norms, which may be something that people in Singapore do anyway, but they don't necessarily do elsewhere. And I do think that one of the reasons why places like New York managed to rebound from initial mistakes faster was because a Behavioral change was in, sparked in New York through messaging that actually said mask wearing is about reminding yourself to act and being supportive of your community um, almost in a patriotic way. Um, so you can actually get positive messages from anthropology. It's not just about risk management. 
What do you think, Piyush? You, you convinced? It sounds like you're, you're at once a, a fan of ethnography, but you also sort of feel like you don't really need to understand why people do things anymore because the data you've got is so good. No, James, I'm, I'm, I'm not. This. All I'm saying is that increasingly, um, the way technology is going, uh, you can do stuff with uh, technology that you couldn't do a few years ago. And, you know, so I'm, I'm still a big believer in the fact you need to understand people and intuitions are important and those only come from cultures and context. So don't get me wrong. Is that I'm wondering where the world is going. And if the world is going in a particular way where if you all live in a virtual world, avatar, and in your virtual world, your digital footprint and your digital persona allows us to observe you all the time. And therefore, I can sort of proxy exactly what you do all the time, understand what you do all the time then the old anthropological techniques of actually going and immersing yourself into real world communities, maybe you don't need that anymore. And I'm just, I'm just asking the question out of um, curiosity more than anything else. Well, can I yeah. jump in here and say that actually, you know, um, actually I'd argue that cyberspace creates more, not less need for anthropology because cyberspace is creating a whole new different range of, um, you know, cultural patterns. Um, when people go from the real world into cyberspace, they don't just abandon their tribalism, um, you know, contrary to what the initial founders of the internet hoped that they would do. Um, actually, they intensify their tribalism because in cyberspace, you have the um, demonstration, what I call generation C, generation customization. You can customize your world, your identity, your likes, your patterns and behaviors to an extreme degree in cyberspace that you can't in real life. So tribalism actually gets intensified so there's actually a lot of anthropologists doing amazing work now going into cyberspace and studying um, the anthropology of cyberspace. They need different tools in that regard. Um, and that's very, very interesting, very helpful. Um, amazing, amazing work being done in that respect. But secondly, as people, and by the way, that's incredibly relevant for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. I mean, there's a whole field of anthropology of Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, um, you know, ether, all of that, which is very relevant to say a place like Singapore, which have been so unbelievably innovative in terms of trying to push that through with the MAS. Um, but secondly, you have to put cyberspace in context. And that context includes the physical real world allegiances and patterns of the people who are creating cyberspace, which have been ignored. The coders and their tribalism matters deeply. The people who are building the architecture of the cyberspace, and I talk in my book about groups like the IETF, who are the totally ignored geeks who actually create the architecture of the internet. That matters deeply. Um, mm -hmm. The physical experience in which we consume cyberspace matters. I have a passage on how you can't understand teenage cell phone use um, until you look at what they're doing in the physical world, real world too. And that helps explain the patterns in cyberspace too. Um, so the context matters. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. We were saying just beforehand, I, I began my career running a team in a think tank in London, which hired ethnographers when this was all called deep hanging out. I remember was the phrase that people used to describe ethnography when you were hanging around in cafes watching people using mobile phones. Let's, um, let, let's sort of take a few more, few more questions here. So Angad Singh, uh, who's a product data science designer at Twitter on it, just about the topic you're talking about, Julian, but a slightly different cut. So he asks um, how anthropology can explain the behavior and incentives of social media users and communities that form online. So he says some are beautiful communities focused around art, some are toxic communities spreading hate. So, and I guess um, Piyush is probably interested in this as well because you have to track these communities online. So what, what can anthropology tell us about that side of um, technology? Anthropology can tell us a lot of things. Firstly, that the actual act of observation and immersion is powerful in cyberspace as in real world. And let's say the anthropologists were going into different chat rooms and groups and just immersing themselves to try and see the totality of the patterns that are driving them. Um, secondly, and I hate to say this, but, in, but empathy, um, I don't hate to say it, but I mean, I, I will say this, sorry. Many people might hate to hear this. Empathy for people who are different from you matters as much in cyberspace as it does in the real world if you want to understand them. Um, there's a team in Google, for example, that has spent time, which I write about in the book, trying to actually go and talk and listen to conspiracy theorists to get empathy for how they see the world. Um, because they realize that you can't design tools online to try and cope with dangerous conspiracy theories unless you try and see the world through conspiracy theorists' eyes and see what drives them. 
Um, I won't go into the details, but what they found when they actually went and tried to empathize with conspiracy theorists was completely different from what the Google techies and engineers had thought was going on. Uh, really, really, really different. Um, and also, you know, when you start using anthropology theory as opposed to just the methodology of observation to see what's going on in, in cyberspace, all kinds of ideas around the way that people use rituals, the way that groups define boundaries, the question of whether identity is defined in opposition to something or pro something else, the way that people can juggle multiple identities, um, ideas around pollution, which sounds very odd, but it's incredibly important to look at pollution in terms of defining social boundaries or concepts of pollution. All of that can be really relevant to trying to make sense of the tribalism that's happening um, for good and bad and often bad in cyberspace. Very good, excellent. I mean, oh, sorry, go on, Jane, go on. I was gonna say the work that Google's done in relation to trying to understand conspiracy theories, it's, it's really fascinating. We need a lot more of that today. Uh, Piyush, anything to add on that? No, not, I'm a Jillian's expert on how you use anthropology with social media, but uh, yes, what we are seeing in our own work that as we start creating our own communities and we create our own communities, communities of parents, communities of school kids and so on, uh, understanding how to prompt and manage these communities means you've got to have a deep understanding of what the drivers are. So to that extent, yes, you can help shape community, but you also have to participate to understand where the community is going. And sometimes the community runs off on its own. It goes off on a tangent. You've got to try and figure why is it doing what it is doing. It's, these are not easy things. Okay, so I have a question for you, Piyush, from uh, Ekaterina Karchenko. So she asks, can you say a little bit about how DBS does innovation? So you've been talking about the techniques that you use in terms of, you know, some observations, some big data, some other things. But she wants to know, sort of what's the model? Is it that you have a, a kind of core team and a leader who's responsible for innovation? Or do you kind of let that percolate around and, and allow the sort of innovation to bubble up from the bottom. So how, how do you operationalize these insights that you're getting in a, in a big bank? Well, we have a core team whose job is to do anything except innovate. Their job is to just help create the processes and create a culture of innovation. So it's about 10, 12 people. And so they do research and they you know, come up with ideas, but they run the programs. Uh, but I'm a big believer that you've got to make sure that the people own the innovation, otherwise you never get traction with it. And now we do have a somewhat formalish construct. We sort of run innovation, the innovation pyramid at four levels. So there's the top of the house. So once every you know, six months, um, we'll get some 25, 30 people and we get some, you know, some of the sharp, bright minds around the company uh, to go through all of these research people have come up with and try and collectively think about the two or three big ideas that we think could move the needle uh, for the industry or for the bank. And so we choose that to do our equivalent of the Google moonshots except of course we don't have uh, Google's uh, budget. Then the second part of the pyramid is, uh, you know, we focus, uh, we've got about um, uh, 30 odd uh, technology platforms and the platform is led by a tech lead and a business lead. Let's say payments is a platform, for example. And the payments platform has got to be thinking of uh, what we call horizon three. So how do they see the future of payments five years from now? And X percentage of our resources and budgets are devoted not to fixing the payments requirements for the next 12 months, but to thinking and addressing what payments might be in three to five years. So for example, we learned something recently, uh, which is using a, 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 a sort of like a stable coin to change the settlement system globally. We're doing it along with JP Morgan actually. Uh, so that comes out of that. A uh, third process is the journeys I spoke about. Every year we try to do about 100 or 150 customer journeys. And each journey has to be informed by something that makes it really cutting edge. It makes it really differentiated. And so the journey people come up with their own vision for how they can innovate. And then the fourth is the bottom of the pyramid. But said. we source ideas from people. Uh, we give people the time to go ahead and figure out. And the ideas we think are worth it, we just give them the money to go ahead and do it. So it's a structured process, but it involves uh, at different levels, different people do uh, different things. But like I said, the core team doesn't innovate. They just manage this whole process and catalyze it for the company. Very good. Now I have a question from Bill Cornwell. He asked it twice, once on the chat, once on the Q&A. So I think he's determined. And he, uh, his question was, what happens when a country's culture causes issues within a company's culture? As in leaders like Saving Face in Indonesia, says Bill. And Julian, this reminded me of the story in the book, given you were talking about AI. There was a story 
um, you, you used about the different responses. I think it was to facial recognition technology um, in the US and in China where American uh, consumers were very skeptical of this and Chinese consumers didn't seem to be very fussed by it as a, one of your, you know, there are lots of examples in the book of you know, Japanese Kit Kats and whatnot of sort of these fascinating insights that anthropologists have been discovered, but maybe tell that story because I thought it was interesting. And then this question of sort of country and company cultures and how you can manage that and understand it. Well, absolutely. I mean, let me stress one thing very important, which is this, that I'm not saying that culture exists in boxes or that it's fixed, let alone hierarchical. It's a, better to imagine culture as a constantly moving stream or river where new things come in, the banks of the river change, they can, you know, it's not a fixed thing. Um, you know, and that's very, very important to stress because, you know, one story I tell in my book is about Kit Kat and the fact that this started life as a totally British biscuit, um, which was actually came out of a British company created by a Yorkshireman um, Quaker in the late 19th century um, and was taken to Japan, not by the original company, but by Nestle, which had bought um, the original British company um, and didn't do very well, although it was originally marketed as a kind of British um, biscuit, um, until some Japanese managers noticed that sales of Kit Kat were rising suddenly um, in Kyushu, the southern island, for a few months each year. And they couldn't understand why until they realized that some local Japanese teenagers had created a fad for giving each other Kit Kats at exam time, because um, Kit Kat sounds like a Japanese phrase, kitokatsu, which means we shall overcome. And you know, they could have just like said, this is kind of really weird, let's ignore that. Um, this is kind of a case of, you know, Japanese culture being different from elsewhere. But they lent into it and they started marketing Kit Kat subliminally and very subtly as a Shinto prayer tool and omamori, as you say in Japanese, um, to help people with exams. And within three years, 50% of Japanese teenagers were using Kit Kat as an omamori, a Shinto prayer token which again is totally weird to Swiss or British eyes. And then they lent in further and created a vast array of different flavors of Kit Kat with local Japanese flavors like sake and soy sauce and wasabi, um, which took off so dramatically that Kit Kat became a symbol, not of British, British branding, but local Japanese um, branding instead. It became a souvenir. And then they re-imported the Kit Kat bar the matcha green tea one into Britain as a Japanese delicacy. And it was actually made in Germany. So at that point you have to say, well, is Kit Kat Swiss, German, Japanese, or British? And the answer is it's all of them in a kind of fusion of different cultures in a very innovative way. You know, if only politicians could do the same. Um, and one of the points I make about how culture is changing, but it also matters is again, I mean, James mentioned the AI story. Um, Intel sent some anthropologists to study AI facial recognition tools in China and then compare it to America. Um, it showed that there were very different attitudes towards AI and facial recognition tools, which one would expect. Um, they were often very different from what the Americans had assumed to start off with, to make the obvious point that just because it's your worldview, you can't assume it's everyone else's worldview. Um, but they also were changing. And so when um, the Intel researchers started doing the research in China, um, they were very struck that the Chinese, um, many of the Chinese consumers they spoke to accepted facial recognition tools um, as a fairly unremarkable feature of everyday life um, in a way that Americans back in 2017, 2018 could not possibly imagine because for them, um, facial recognition tools were seen as being something that was absolutely appalling because it breached um, I their ideas of privacy and personal sanctity. Um, and that was how the debate started out, a huge gulf. Fast forward to today, and of course, all of us have, well, not all of us, many of us have facial recognition tools on our cell phones, um, which people use constantly to pay for things without having big um, debates about ethics and morality. Maybe we should, but anyway, I'm just saying that that's the reality. And that again indicates that cultures change, attitudes change. Um, and that's another reason why even if you're using big data tools and AI, it pays to look at context because context shifts in seemingly contradictory and sometimes surprising ways. Well, James, uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess on both the topics, the first um, on culture, you know, I believe cultures can shift. 
um, not different from the, the what Jill was referring to, but I strongly believe in creating cultures by design. Uh, we have a tool which we call beans, behavior enablers and nudges. And we think with the appropriate sets of beans, you can actually create your own culture. My favorite example of this is, as I said, I used to work at City. And as you know, by and large, there's been this general paradigm in Singapore. The Singapore is a little bit of a kiasu, risk averse culture. But if you were in City, the City culture is very entrepreneurial. It's very risk taking. So it's the same Singaporean employee, but when they're at City, they behave differently. So how do you get the company culture to trump the country culture? I think it is possible. Not 100% because there's some attributes the country will stay, but you can make a difference. So one thing, for example, at DBS, um, I wanted to try and make it more entrepreneurial. We found very early that there's a lot of problem with our meetings. People said our meetings are really bad, we're bureaucratic, you know, there's the hypo problem, the highest paid person in the room, uh, you know, people don't speak up and so on and so forth. So the bean we came up with was something we called Mojo. Uh, Mojo, the MO stands for the meeting owner, the person who calls the meeting and sets the agenda. But for every meeting, we appointed somebody called a Joe, who's the joyful observer. And the observer's job is only to monitor how the meeting is being conducted. Is everybody getting to participate? Are people paying attention? Is there equal share of voice? If people are busy on their phones, the Joe can call a stop to the meeting and do a phone jenga. Everybody's got to put the phone in the center of the table. We found just by creating an observation process, nothing else the meeting quality improved dramatically because people figure they're being observed. And I think you had something like that in the context of General Motors or something in your book, Jilly. And I've seen that to be true, that observation makes a difference. Then in the first couple of meetings, the young kid, um, after I was in the meeting, to, uh, you know, she was the Joe. And she said the meeting was hopeless. It was hopeless because Piyush lost his temper. And she was right. And I said, yes, you're right. I shouldn't have. The fact that I acknowledged I had and she was able to call me out that fundamentally changed the way people are willing to engage with each other. And so now we have, you know, meeting. My point is that cultures can be created and cultures uh, evolve. So you can create a company culture, which is a little bit different from a country culture, maybe not entirely, but, but a little bit. The other thing where Jillian was going there, and I agree with that entirely. So she stopped short at saying everybody's using facial recognition tools, uh, and so people aren't worried. Uh, but in reality, think about the nature of data. First of all, the nature of data privacy is not absolute. It's evolved over the centuries. In the Roman baths time, people took baths together. Uh, in Victorian England, people sort of, you know, uh, did a bunch of things together. In fact, our modern no notion of data privacy can be tracked back to Kodak's invention of the photograph. And at that time, the US Post and Telegraph was allowed to open people's telegrams and mails, you know, in transit. It's only in the last 150 years where our notion of privacy has evolved to where it is today. But quite clearly, privacy notions vary. So in the early days of the, of the pandemic at DBS, we had our first case of uh, the virus on February 13th, I remember. In 24 hours, we used a bunch of employee data. We used Turnstile tap data, we did Outlook data, we took the internal Wi-Fi data. And within 24 hours, we triangulated and found the 34 people who'd been in direct contact with the person with the virus and the 180 people who were two degrees of separation. And as a consequence, we were able to quarantine a bunch of employees and we were able to give alerts to another bunch of employees that they might be at risk. Now that use of data, all our employees loved. They were really happy with the fact that I'd used the data to make them secure. But when I wrote about this in an FT op-ed a few months later, I got trolled. I got trolled by everybody in the West who said, you know, you cannot use employees' data in this way and it's not acceptable. So it's obviously, it depends on which context it comes from. I think in Asia, the general belief is society rights matter and people's rights matter almost as much as the individual's rights. And so what you do in this context is different. And finally, what Jillian said, what you say you do is very different. She talked about facial recognition. I ask everybody, would you like Big Brother like to be tracked 24 seven all the time? People know where you are. And 100% the response is no. Then I ask people to hand me their, their phones. And I look at the phone, and not only does the telco know where you are all the time, you've got every mobile phone giving a location. Uh, your Google Maps is on, your Waze is on. You're letting people know where you are all the time. So your actions belie your words. And the underlying reason for that is the barter system Jillian talks about in her book, that there's a value exchange in your head. And the value exchange in your head sometimes works for people. It depends on what generation you are. It depends whether you're young or you're old. But even in your own head, it depends on your context. In the morning, I don't feel like giving my phone a number. But in the afternoon, there's a fantastic deal being offered if I give my name and email. And I give my name and email because I love the deal. So all of these things suggest to me that nothing, none of this is absolute. It is contextual. And you've got to be very thoughtful about what the context is.
Yeah, well, I yeah. agree. I mean, you know, just very briefly, for those who haven't seen the book, I do describe General Motors, um, its internal operations, um, which was studied by anthropologists to look at how different groups were misunderstanding each other. Um, you know, teams of engineers from Rüsselsheim in Germany were at loggerheads with Tennessee, with the loggerheads with D Detroit. And this question about meetings is crucial. I think the Mojo and Joe ideas brilliantly. But I also look at the whole, what really drives the tech and digital economy. And I argue it's really barter. And barter is not a word that economists or policymakers like to talk about, let, let alone techies, because it sounds so primeval. Um, but actually barter is absolutely the core of what we ignore about the tech sector and digital world today. Let's just take a couple of questions to wrap up because, um, and I'll, I'll let you both come in. I said we'd finish at 8.30. So um, we had a question uh, from, somebody didn't give their name, but they did say that they work for the world's largest technology focused platform stack overflow. And their question, which is an interesting one is how do you avoid anthropology turning into a sort of way of reflecting cultural stereotypes, as in, you know, you discover the Chinese are pragmatic and good with business and Indians tend to be very vocal and combative in the way that they talk. So what, 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 about, what about that as an issue, Julian? Entirely fair question. You know, how do, we, how do we sort of anthropologists acting like they're in a zoo and putting people in cages with all the stereotypes and stuff? And um, the answer is that academic anthropologists don't do that because they really try and take a deep, subtle multi-led approach looking at culture and stress this point about porous boundaries, cultures changing, um, they don't exist as boxes. I can't stress that strongly enough. Um, you know, anthropology light when it's picked up easily sometimes does do that. And we need to fight against that because cultures do shift and they're always multi-led and contradictory. Very good, perfect answer for five minutes to go. So let's see if we can get a couple more in. So Simon Schilbeck, who's a professor at the Singapore Management University uh, here and founder of Handprint, says, what can anthropology teach us about how we should tackle climate change that we cannot learn from psychological research or behavioral economics? Three things. One, we need to have empathy for what's happening on the other side of the world or people who don't seem like us, because this really is a global problem. And it's far too easy for people to ignore what's happening elsewhere. We learned with COVID, what a mistake that is. Two, we need to think about messages um, and communication. How do you actually change behavior and get populations to buy in? Um, because without that, never mind just businesses and governments, without that, we're not going to get the level of policy response we need. And three, it really shows why we need to take a joined up view to life and look at context. Um, one of the problems with our intellectual tools in the late 20th century is most of them are bounded and marked by tunnel vision because they ignored what was not in the model, not on the balance sheet, not in the big data set. The environment for many, many years was one of those things that was an externality. Um, and we've now realized through climate change and COVID why externalities shouldn't be external. We need lateral vision, not tunnel vision. Excellent. One of those preceding questions, um, the one about culture, was Pauline Sims, so apologies for that, Pauline. Uh, Priyush, one for, Priyush, sorry, one for you. Um, how do you measure the, the impact and ROI of cultural anthropology in a corporate okay. environment? So it's, it's, quite, it's quite a kind of sort of antithetical That's question. Definitely one for you, Priyush. How, how, do you, how do you measure the effectiveness of anthropologists like Gillian wandering around BBS? So I have to tell you, I, I'm not a big believer in measuring everything through ROIs uh, a priori. I think a lot of times the collective outcomes uh, come at the end. Uh, but to me, the biggest, uh, this thing is, are you getting a uh, positive customer response and customer feedback? Certainly when we look at the external world, uh, we survey and manage everything at the customer level and group level. And uh, if you're getting it right, and we've been able to attend to the emotional and the deep rooted psychological needs of customers and how customers behave, uh, customers will vote with their feet. So you show you see it in your market share, but you see it in customer surveys and customer responses. We do a lot of that. By the way, we do. We also do a lot of this observation and journey thinking with our own employees. So we run a lot of employee journeys, and the same thing shows up. Uh, you can figure out whether you're actually hitting the spot, understanding from observation and behavior whether you're doing the right thing vis-a-vis uh, -vis your employees. Very good. All right, we're nearly out of time, so I have two things to say. One, if you don't bank the DBS, you certainly should. 
Two, if you haven't bought a copy of Anthrovision, how anthropology can explain business and life, you should do because it's really interesting. Julian, last word to you. What's next for, for you? Um, you know, when are you going to be in Singapore? When do you think you're going to be able to come here? And I know you've just written one book, but what's uh, what's kind of next on your uh, sort of voracious commentators uh, radar? So. Well, I'm my, my as I said, my day job is that I oversee the editorial board. So I spend every morning at um, for an hour at six o'clock each morning, New York time, with my colleagues at the FT trying to make sense of the world and decide how we oversee um, where we're going intellectually. You know, the brains trust, if you like. Um, I am currently absolutely fascinated and obsessed with two topics. One is climate change, which I write a lot about, and I created this platform, Moral Money, at the Financial Times, um, where a team of people cover it day in, day out. So if you're not signed up to Moral Money newsletter yet, um, please do. Um, and the other thing I'm fascinated by is crypto. And I'm spending a lot of time working on that right now. I'm particularly interested in what's happening in Singapore right now with the MAS um, and some of the very bold experiments there, also with the BIS. And I absolutely hope to be out of Singapore at some point in the coming months when the world starts to hopefully reopen again, because I want to know a lot more about this. And I'll just end by where I started by saying, I'm only alive today because of some of the amazing advances in medicine at Singapore. Um, if I'd been anywhere else in the world, I wouldn't have survived um, 20 years ago. Um, it really is an astonishing place. It's been a great sort of crucible of experimentation and bold policy ideas in many levels, both corporate and the policy making world in recent years. And I'm just very, very honored to have a chance to talk to the Singaporean community um, about some of these ideas because if there's anywhere on the map that knows the power of cultural collision and blending and fusion and experimentation, I think it probably is Singapore. So thank you very much indeed. Very good. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. When Gillian comes, we'll, we'll press gang her into doing an event in person at, uh, at 1880 in Singapore, and, and then we can get the club to buy you lunch as well. So there we are. That's reason enough to come. So Piyush, Gillian, thank you so much. That was a really splendid conversation. Um, I much appreciate it. Everyone go buy the book, move your bank account to DBS. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, James. Thanks, Gillian. Good catching up. All right. Thank Bye. you.